Guys, a lot of times when I make these phone calls, I get rejected a lot. It's, it's very much like my junior high days. But fortunately, I have friends, and sometimes friends come through. Hey Patrick, is it possible you call up your friend and get him on to our class? Your friend Jerry? Why sure, I'll call Jerry Burkheimer. I'll call some friends that know Jerry that can put you in touch with him. Hey Jerry, remember me buddy? Guys, our next guest is Jerry Bruckheimer, the mega producer. Fellas, this is another episode of Film Nation, The Blockbuster. Guys, welcome back to another class. Our next guest is a filmmaker that has had a huge impact in cinema. Uh, when I was your age, fellas, I put on my top list two of his favorite films, uh, Beverly Hills Cop and Top Gun. The list that you guys shared, you put his films of Pirates of the Caribbean uh, and national franchise. Um, <coughs> this is a generational filmmaker for us. In between us, we also saw blockbusters such as Bad Boys, Remember the Titans, Gone in 60 Seconds. The list is huge. His television credits uh, earned him 10 Emmys, uh, and numerous nominations with The Amazing Race and the CSI franchise. His films made over $10 billion worldwide. Jerry Bruckheimer, thank you so much for joining our class today. Thanks, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here. We really do appreciate it. Um, COVID-19 ha has taken a lot from us. Uh, it's put us in our current classroom setting, but, it, you know, staggering loss of life. Um, the entertainment industry, though, has really taken a hard impact with it. Um, Top Gun Maverick uh, was supposed to come out last year, but due to COVID, it was pushed back. Um, studios such as Warner Brothers and Disney have been finding ways of getting films out there, uh, like on their streaming platforms. Emotionally, what was it like to have something like Top Gun Maverick and not be able to share it uh, when you were hoping to and still holding on to it? Well, obviously, it's a terrific film. Anybody who's seen it uh, say it's just one of the best movies out there. And, you know, I won't discredit it, even though uh, I worked on it. So it's, it's fabulous. Can't wait for everybody to see it. It's some of the greatest flying sequences you've ever seen. It's all done real. We had a great collaboration with the Navy. You, you, get, you get a flight in an F-18 that you've never seen before. And when you see it in IMAX, it's, it's really spectacular. So I can't wait till uh, the theaters are open. At least in a lot of the states are closed, unfortunately. Some states are still open. But hopefully this summer, when we have it scheduled for July 2nd, hopefully we'll make it. Um, when we first, well, when that was on our spring, uh, not spring break, sorry, uh, the Super Bowl, uh, we saw last year, we saw the promo for Top Gun Maverick, as well as other films uh, that were supposed to come out that summer. Are you afraid? Um, that with several cinemas in real dire straits, uh, AMC has you know, had to worry about bankruptcy. Are you afraid that these big summer blockbusters uh, are on the verge of a possible deathbed with cinema or, or you have hope? What is the silver lining in that hope? Well, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, I, I think once we get out of this pandemic and we're slowly getting there, People are going to want to get out of their houses. They're going to want to go to the theaters. <clears throat> and that's why we make movies. We're filling those theaters up with a lot of, a lot of people to you know, enjoy the entertainment that we create here in Hollywood. So I think it's going to be like the Roaring Twenties. People will be sick and tired of sitting home and want to get out and have some fun. It's, you know, it's a communal experience. Not every movie is a communal experience, but Top Gun certainly is. And when you have people around you who are laughing and cheering and applauding and feeling something, that's what a theater does for you. So, they're going to be around for a long time. We've always, we've always said the theaters are over when VCRs came out, when the internet came out, when we had streaming. I said the end of theaters. Yet we have pictures that will go out and do over a billion dollars. So look at theaters are going to be around. You're not going to sit in your, in your living room with your mom and pop and watch everything. You're going to want to get out there. Well, I mean, the, the theater experience, like, as you said, just being in a crowd, you, you build off an energy that the crowd's feeling and, and the sound, the immersive sound that you would get 
and that you, you just don't get uh, those feelings at home. There's something really special about going to a movie, a big movie, and it's opening weekend. Yes. Uh, we have all the fans who are cheering and applauding at every credit. They've been waiting, and it's pen up anxiety to see something that uh, we've created here, and, and we take care in everything we do, and we have great actors, great writers, great directors, and so, and that certainly Top Gun has Tom Cruise back, which is a fantastic way for him to give you another Top Gun. Yeah. Now, uh, as I was sharing earlier, Top Gun was one of my all-time favorite films when I was a high school student back in 1986. Uh, Beverly Hills Cop also was up there in 1984. 1983, one of your first big hits was um, uh, Flashdance. And how much do you think, because all of those soundtracks were very much on heavy uh, rotation on MTV, um, how much do you believe MTV impacted your early career and how much do you think you impacted MTV? Well, I think it's, it's a, a double-edged sword here. I think we, we helped each other. There's no doubt about it. When we saw what MTV was doing while we were casting for Flashdance, we said, we've got to be a part of this. And we, you know, we created videos for them and we had great artists do our songs and great writers. So it was a designed effort to get MTV as part of marketing your film. Do you think that it, the platform changed filmmaking with the way they were doing music videos and things? Did it influence <laughs> yours? Certainly a lot of the directors of those music videos became um, feature directors. So it certainly helped and they had a, a unique visual style, which I always like. I always like our pictures to have something unique and special and what they look like. So they don't look like everything else you see in commercials or on, in the cinema. So we look very carefully at commercial directors and video directors and anybody who has a real keen eye knows how to tell a story in a very short period of time. Okay. So those short story filmmakers, are, are somebody that you look at as a, a possibility for a future filmmaker? Well, Michael Bay, who did the first Bad Boys, was a commercial right. director, did videos. You know, he did Transformers series. Uh, so he's a huge, big director. That was right. his first movie. We found him out of, out of uh, commercials and videos. Oh, wow. Well. Uh, now, when you're producing a film, uh, two of your films are the top five most expensive films of all time. Pirates of the Caribbean at Worlds and uh, Stranger Tides. They, they have humongous budgets with almost uh, 300 million and $370 million. Um, exactly. Uh, you know, when you look back at Top Gun, which was $15 million, um, I mean, what is going into making uh, films that have a cost of, of a price tag of $300 million plus? Well, you know, it's it, anytime you, you're on the water, it gets very expensive. Okay. So Pirates is on the water. Had a lot of visual effects. That's expensive. But you know what's fun about it? It's on the screen. And it, the audience doesn't care what you spend on a movie. They just want to be entertained. And we yeah. want to give them the big, biggest bang for their buck. So every penny that we spend on that movie is right up there on the screen. You see Johnny Depp going through all his, all his wonderful antics. Now, are you worried um, with... COVID, uh, that, will that change like some of these higher price tag budget films? Um, are you gonna reel it back in just because the theaters haven't got completely open yet? Well, I think we are, they always want to reel it in. It's, it's, since the beginning of time, they want us to spend less money on movies. But unfortunately, you know, labor goes up, everything else goes up, talent right. goes up. As we start building these blockbusters, people get paid more money, just the way it is. And COVID, or COVID costs, we have three shows shooting right now. And you have to add a certain amount for COVID to protect everybody. Most of my guys are not going to go into the entertainment industry, but they are going to be in business. Um, you're a major risk taker. Your budgets show that you're a, a risk taker. Uh, I, you know, you were a risk taker with Pirates of the Caribbean because at, there was some criticism at first when you announced it, like people were thinking, wait, it's, it's a Disney ride, but it was something you believed in. But one of the bigger risks that I'm, I'm really proud of that is that uh, with Beverly Hills Cop, um, you took a huge risk in casting Eddie Murphy um, because black actors were not normally given the lead role. And you cast Eddie Murphy, who was a great stand-up comic, people knew him from Saturday Night Live, but did not have 
leading credentials prior to this. And then that film went on to be the highest grossing R-rated movie for almost two decades. How is it that you decide to take risk? What is your judgment in using and making risk uh, management and assessment? You know, it's always about talent. You know, it's, it's talent is the most important thing. Eddie Murphy is an enormous talent. He was an enormous talent when he was on Saturday Night Live, when he did the few movies he did before he did Beverly Hills Cop. Doesn't matter. If you have a, a really talented actor in front of the screen, great director, great writers, you're going to do really well. When you went to the studio were, with saying that you want to cast Eddie, was there, was there pushback from that? And how were you able to justify it? We, we heard, you know, stories that no actor, uh, African-American actor had ever grossed more than like $20 million. And I think it was Richard Pryor. But, you know, we really felt that Eddie was so talented. And we convinced the studio, although they were in favor of him too. They loved Eddie. They had to deal with Eddie. So it wasn't that hard. It was other people outside uh, Paramount and outside our group that were shooting arrows at it, which is normal. What are the, the, the great rewards of being a producer, but what are the stressors that my guy should be aware of? Well, for me, every, it's different for everybody. For okay. me, it's standing in the back of a theater and seeing people get entertained by what we do. That's my biggest joy. See them laugh, see them cry, see them applaud. Uh, I don't do it for the money anymore because fortunately, I've been very fortunate okay. in, in, in my career so far. And I never worried about that. I always worried about entertaining audiences. And that's why I think we've had the success. The audience is always the king. They're the ones we're trying to entertain. They're the ones we're trying to please. And if we get it right, you can do really well. And a lot of times we've gotten it right. And then, so what's on the flip side? What's the stressors of being a producer? I mean, what's, what's the things that's causing you to bite your nails and things like that? Uh, you know, it's, it's always getting the talent to commit, getting a good screenplay, getting the correct writers, the correct directors, you know, chasing after people that you really want and how do you get them and then getting the money to do it. That's the hard part too, convincing somebody that you have something special that can make the money. Now you've worked with some of the same talents over and over. You've had a, a long repetitive relationship with people such as Johnny Depp, Nicolas Cage, Will Smith, Denzel Washington, Tom Cruise, Hans Zimmer, Michael Bay, plus your production team. There's people behind the scenes that you've had a, a long working relationship with. Um, what is it, what's the key leadership that you provide in, in developing those long-term relationships? You know, we develop, we develop a, a, a system, not a really a system, but we take care of talent. We okay. make sure that when they come on the set, the only thing they got to worry about is knowing their lines and doing a great job. That's all. We'll take care of everything else. We'll make sure that they're comfortable, they have the right people around them to make sure they can shine. And you build the trust up with the talent. You protect them, take care of them, and you make sure that they have the, the, all the tools to do what they do best, which is either directing, acting, writing, whatever. What, what do you think is one of the first things you do to establish that trust with you, the talent? Well, I think, you know, they ask you questions, you give them answers. They ask you for certain things, you give it to them. Uh, they want stuff, they want changes in the script, they want to do things, you talk it over with them. And if you agree with them, you do it. Okay. If not, you say, here's why we did it this way. And you argue it out. And always the best argument wins. But we're, we're upfront and straight about it. Filmmakers are known to have egos. Um, so therefore, there's sometimes conflict on a set. How do you deal, how do you manage conflict? Because you're the producer, you have to please everybody, you know, well, you don't have to necessarily please everybody, but you want to make sure everybody's pleased so they continue working in an environment that they, they like working with you. So how do you handle conflict on a set? Well, by being sure <laughs> honest and lay out all, of, all the, the things that are surround the problem and try to figure out how to, how to solve it. There's always a solve. You just got to find it. And so we've been doing it a long time and we've figured out a lot of ways to solve problems. Okay. Um, now, my school principal, he also teaches film study. Uh, he believes Black Hawk Down is your most important picture. That's what he teaches his students. Uh, but you, it's your most important picture you've ever produced. Would you agree or disagree with him? Look, it's, it's, it's part of the movies that we've made. They're all your kids. You love them all. It's certainly an important movie. You know, it, it tells a story 
of these really brave men who lost their lives in, right. in, in, in the moment issue. And, you know, after we finished the movie, the greatest gratification that we got, we had a screening for all the wives and children of the men that lost their lives. Yeah. And the kids and the parents came up to me and say, thank you so much for making this movie. My dad or my husband will never be forgotten. And that's so important for me. Uh, these men, you know, don't get paid a lot of money. They love their country. They fight for their country. And I commend them. You know, I so I'm a, you know, I'm, a, I'm somebody who really loves this country and loves the people who fight for it and protect our, our shores and our freedoms. If somebody was to come to you and say, I mean, and I know you just said you love all the films that you produce, right. but it says, hey, I need just one selection to represent you as a producer and the work that, you, that you've done as your career, what would that film be? I'd give them a list of all of them and say, you pick it. It's not for me to pick. Okay. Uh, well, your, your films have truly impacted audiences worldwide. I mean, as I've shared, you know, growing up for me, you know, uh, Top Gun was absolutely one of my favorite uh, all-time films. Uh, watching my sons grow up, watching them fall in love with the Pirates of the Caribbean franchise, which is what my students have put on their, on their top 10 list as one of their all-time favorites. So, uh, Mr. Brockheimer, thank you for, for this part. Uh, we've come through the heavy academic questions. Now we are ready for five quick questions. Uh, this is just a quick little game here. Um, quick responses. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. Question number one. Um, I believe after watching Your Amazing Race, that is the one reality television show I feel like if I was on it, I could compete for the win. What would be your suggestions on winning the Amazing Race? Well, I think you got to watch it. You got to watch what, what other teams did and the mistakes they made. You learn a lot by watching some of the previous episodes. That's the key. Okay. I will recall that if I ever get on there. Question two, you're the owner of the NHL's newest franchise, uh, the Seattle Kraken, um, which is about to take the ice here this upcoming season. Congratulations on that. If you could build a machine that would allow you to have any of the all-time greats on the ice skating for the Kraken, who would you pick? Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a big fan of Wayne Gretzky, who's one of the greatest players ever. There are two, there are two players that, you know, I, I, one I grew up with and one I watched uh, as a fan, and one was Gordy Howe, who's one yes. of the greatest players ever, and then there's Wayne. So those two are the, for me, the the, the pinnacle of great talent. Both amazing guys on the ice, and so good luck on this upcoming season. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, you have question number three. Uh, you have a home here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, and so welcome on, on that part. Um, explain to your fellow filmmakers why they too should also a uh, home here in Kentucky. It's a fantastic state. My wife's from there, we love it. it the people are fantastic. We, we have such a nice group of friends there. We have this, we live in right around this little town called Bloomfield. My wife always likes to entertain people and do things right, so we opened a little uh, ice cream parlor called the Double Dip, Double Dip there in, in Bloomfield. So if you ever get out there, stop by the Double Dip, and there's an Ernie's Tavern right next to it. So she's a great entertainer and loves hospitality, and so she, we got some of the best ice cream in the state of Kentucky. So I hope people get out there. Definitely try it. Question number four, what is the one film that you love, that you wish you would have produced? Well, I love The Godfather. I, you know, that was one of my favorite films. I also love movies like, David Lean's my favorite director, one of my favorite directors, I should say. And, you know, Bridge on the River Kwai, Dr. Zhivago, some of the great films that he made. And, you know, they're, they're back in the time machine, but, you know, I look back at those great filmmakers and they're fabulous storytellers and they hold up today. Yes. Is there, is there any of those classic films that you, uh, when you bring on a new director of it, you're like, hey, you should watch this before you make a film? Well, hopefully the directors we pick will have watched those movies, otherwise they, they shouldn't be working with us. But, you know, they, they better know of their film history. All right, Quish, fifth question, final question. What has become of Benjamin Franklin Gates? What's he up to? We're working on we're working on a couple we're working on a film and working on something maybe for for Disney Plus 
but I think a film is coming along quite well. So hopefully we'll get a screenplay shortly that we'll be able to take to the studio and they want to make. Very good. Jerry Bruckheimer, thank you so much for joining a part of yeah. our class and being here. We really appreciate it. Pleasure. You know, we got future filmmakers in the audience, I'm sure, and titans of industry. So, and so, some great people, I'm sure, in your classes. And I hope they stay in school and get the best education they can. There's nothing better than getting a great education. It gives you an enormous amount of confidence. And I wish that I would stay in a little school a little longer. I graduated college, but I'm sure I could have could have got a doctorate or, or, uh, or something else. But school is the best. It is. It's a pretty fun gig to have, too, as right. well. So thank you so much, Jerry. Thanks. Thank you, Jerry, for being a part of this class. Really appreciate it. And for sharing your experiences as a very successful filmmaker with us. We are totally looking forward to Top Gun Maverick upon its summer release after a year delay and wish you well. Guys, if you paid attention, you will notice that to be successful, it's about building relationships and setting a good environment. Sometimes you also have to take risk, and risk will require you to do the right things. I was able to be able to get this conversation with having a great relationship with one of my co-workers who had worked with Mr. Bruckheimer in the past. So build those relationships. It's going to be important to your own success in the future. And a number of those relationships that you're going to make in life are going to be relationships that inspire you. One of these, for me, is Nicholas Freibert, a former student of mine who I am very proud of for everything he's accomplished. And so he is going to give us some bonus content because he gets to talk to Jerry Bruckheimer and ask three more very important questions. So guys, stick around for that. As always, fellas, remain awesome, be nice, stay safe. I'll see you soon, guys. All right, Nikki, it's your turn to take the floor. Go get him. How were you able to break into the business and what advice would you give to somebody who wants to get into the business today? Well, I got in through advertising. What I did after I graduated college, I moved back home and started in a mailroom for a big advertising agency in Detroit and worked myself into the television department where they made commercials and eventually became an assistant producer and then a producer and won some awards in Cannes and a bunch of uh, advertising awards for some Pepsi commercials I did. And I got recognized by a director who I'd worked with who was coming out to to Hollywood to make a film. And he said, look, I want to make this film. I want you to help me produce it. And that's how I got to Hollywood. I always bet on myself and took a chance and get very much money to go out there. But I think if you, if you believe in what you can do and you're smart about it, you can do just about anything. The one thing you can't do is do something you're not good at. That's what I tell everybody. A lot of things I wouldn't be good at. I'd love to be an actor. I'm not good at it. Uh, there are a lot of things that, that, intrigue me. I'd love to be a hockey player. I'm not very good at it. So you got to find something that you're good at that you excel in, whether it's math or science or reading or whatever it is good and follow that path to what you ultimate, your ultimate goal is. Wow, that's incredible. So second question is, what do you consider to be the greatest accomplishment in your career? You know, I think the fact that we've found so much new talent, the fact that we've discovered so many great actors and directors and made films for a worldwide audience. So many people have been entertained by the films that we've made and the television that we do. And that's what makes me feel great, that we can take you away from all the trials and tribulations you have to deal with in a day and the problems that people have and make you forget about it for an hour, an hour and a half or two hours and make you think about something that's uplifting or thoughtful and just to make your day just a little bit better. That's what I love doing. Wow, <laughs> love that. <laughs> so um, last question is that one of my favorite movies of all time was um, Top Gun and one of my favorite actors is um, Tom Cruise. So what was it like working with him in Top Gun? Well, Tom's a fabulous guy. He's, a, he's an amazing artist. 
He is by far the best producer, even though he's not a producer, but he does produce some stuff. He did Top Gun with me. Uh, he's just a really smart man. And what's so great about him, he works so hard. He gets up early in the morning, he works out. He knows his lines. He understands everything about every character. He wants to make the movie as good as possible. You know what? He grew up in Kentucky. He went, I think he went to mail in one of the schools there. That's where he first started. Uh, so he's a Kentucky boy too. He, his parents, parents eventually moved away when he was still young. But he is the hardest working individual I know. He le lives, breathes, and dies for what his work is. And, you know, he's generous with his time. He's great to other actors. He's wonderful to everybody around him. He's a straight shooter, and he's just a, a fabulous individual, and he's exceedingly smart. He'd wow. be a success in any industry he got himself into, or anything he wanted to do. Wow, my, um, my grandma is a big fan of him. I think both my grandmas are. <laughs> great, well, you're gonna love the new Top Gun movie. I can't wait for you to see it. Oh, yes, I so can't wait. I'm planning to see it this summer. Hey, Mr. Brockheimer, I just want to say thanks again for taking your time to speak with Coach Wagner and his Renee Film Study class, and for also allowing me to interview you. It has been an absolute honor. Your work has been so inspiring to, all, to me and to, for all those people out there that have a love and passion for film. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much again.